Hello, uh, hello UbuCon. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Martin Wimpress. Um, I am a vintage 1972 human meat bag. Uh, I'm an Ubuntu member, uh, and I've been a, an Ubuntu community contributor since 2004. Uh, and I have a couple of community passion projects. I make the green edition of Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu Mate. Um, and, oh, I'm going to have to get my phone out because I've had a slide fail. So just bear with me a moment. <clears throat> um, yes, so I make the uh, green version of Ubuntu Mate. Has anyone heard of it? Use it? Okay. Makes it all the more worthwhile. Um, and uh, I also make a podcast with my friends. Um, so uh, we do the Ubuntu podcast. And this is us, uh, a listener, meet up earlier this year in the UK. Uh, so that's uh, Dr. Laura Cowan, me in the middle with Alan Pope or Popey, uh, Mark Johnson, and the big fella at the back is Joe Ressington. The Ubuntu podcast is a weekly audio magazine that celebrates, uh, that celebrates the achievements of the um, Ubuntu community. Is there any Ubuntu podcast listeners here today? Ah, oh, fabulous. Don't forget to tell your friends. Right then, but uh, I also work for Canonical. Um, and Canonical is the sponsor of Ubuntu. Uh, and one of my roles there is as a developer advocate for Snapcraft and community advocate for Ubuntu. So today I'm here to talk to you about Snapcraft and Snaps. Um, Anyone here heard of or familiar with Snaps or Snapcraft? Okay, there's some hands going up, some really enthusiastic hands at the back there. You get a gold star. I'll pay you later. Brilliant. So, when developers ask us what is Snapcraft, this is our elevator pitch. Snapcraft is the app store for Linux. It took us a couple of years to get to this succinct description of what Snapcraft is. That resonates with developers and users. Because of these mobile devices that we all carry around now, be it Android or iOS or Ubuntu Touch, the App Store is a popularized concept now. So we inevitably get asked, what are snaps? So snaps are self-contained software packages for Linux. They work on all major Linux distributions without modification. They are simple to create and publish when you compare them to the traditional methods of creating applications for Linux. They're suitable for any class of application, so you can use them for uh, packaging and distributing desktop applications or server class applications, uh, command line utilities, languages, um, the whole gamut. They automatically update over the air <coughs> and they provide a central place for developers to publish their software and for users to find their software. We also get asked, but why? So, in order to answer that question, I'm going to explain how we got here. And it's fitting because we now get to look back over 15 years of software delivery uh, on Ubuntu and within Canonical and the lessons that we learned along the way in order to inform what we did around snaps. So, to understand why we're so passionate about snaps, we need to understand what it was like before snaps existed. So, this is where being a 1972 vintage human meat bag is advantageous. We're going to step back in time. We're going to see how the Linux App Store has evolved. So we're going to hop into our DeLorean, accelerate to 88 miles per hour, harness 1.21 gigawatts of power, and transport ourselves back to 13 BC. That's 13 years before Canonical in 1991 when Linux first got started. This is how software was distributed where I live in England in 1991. Other floppy disk formats were popular, but this was emerging as the most popular. 
You could buy them in cardboard boxes in shops, you would get them on magazines, um, and you could swap them with your friends. Maybe you had one of these amazing bits of equipment. You could dial up a local BBS, and you could download software very, very slowly. You had to know the BBS phone numbers, and those were printed in magazines or shared by word of mouth amongst friends. And once you dialed up, you got to rummage through their software catalogs and find the software that you wanted and download it. You basically had to be this guy. Either someone who knew where to find the software or sharing it by word of mouth, or you had to hunt for the software you wanted in software catalogs and online forums. It was fun and it was exciting, but it was not accessible to non-geeks. And at this time, it was very much commonplace for the installation instructions in open source projects to um, advocate building from source. Configure, make, make, install was the mantra for many people, and it still is today. Huh? Well, maybe it does. Um, although these days, make could be QMake or CMake or Mason, or Cargo, or NPM, or Pip, or Gem, or Yarn, or Ann, or Gradle, or Composer, or Hex. So let's step forward a couple of years to 1993. The internet was really taking off at this point. We were all surfing on the information superhighway uh, and um, riding through cyberspace, apparently. Uh, this was also the year that these two distributions started, Slackware and Debian. Uh, they ushered in uh, the concept of repositories. Um, this was curated software archives, archives usually pre-compiled to save time. Uh, users could search for the software that they wanted and install it on their computer, and then updates were delivered via the same mechanism via the internet. Uh, this was a feature that Linux distributions had that mainstream operating systems did not. It was also a time where software packagement started to evolve. We had um, packages from Slackware, which were little more than tarballs at the time. We had uh, the Deb format coming out of the Debian project. And a couple of years later, we had an RPM uh, arrive from the Red Hat project. Installing software consisted of um, grabbing packages from within the main repositories to run uh, on your distribution, or maybe you could find them on third-party enthusiast sites in the case of Slackware. Step forward a couple of years, and graphical environments made it easier to manage software. This is the Synaptic Package Manager. It was very popular at the time, uh, and made accessing software very easy for users. Uh, and it's still popular today. Uh, what you may not know is that one of the original apt developers and two of the Synaptic Package Manager developers work on the Snap team today. Snap development has a long heritage in software packaging and distribution. So let's move forward to 2004. This is when Ubuntu had its first release. And before Canonical and Ubuntu existed, it was known as No Name Yet. In October of 2004, uh, the first release of Ubuntu uh, came out, and that was 14.10, codenamed the Warty Warthog. And it's this release that we're going to be celebrating a little bit later on this evening. Each release of Ubuntu shipped with a fairly static set of packages, um, only receiving bug fixes and security updates after the fact. If you wanted newer software, um, then you would have to go and hunt down the source code and compile it yourself, or maybe one of those magazine cover discs would have pre-compiled versions, or you could buy it in box sets in a store, or um, maybe a developer has a pre-compiled binary on their SourceForge page or something like that. From the years of 2004 to 2009, we operated the Ship It service, where you would send CDs containing the latest distribution to anywhere in the world. These were instrumental in getting Ubuntu, the Ubuntu desktop and server popularized and in the ha hands of people that wanted to access free software. The server platform was growing in popularity at this time. 
uh, and there were many parts of the web that were starting to run uh, Linux, uh, sorry, um, Apache and MySQL and PHP on top of Ubuntu. App developers wanted to start targeting Ubuntu because this is where the user base was. But it was still difficult for third parties to get their software built for all supported architectures and discoverable by users. So in 2007, Canonical created Personal Package Archives. These were for open source projects and provided a free build service and were designed for the developers to prepare their software for inclusion in the next release of whatever um, Ubuntu release was coming up. They gained huge popularity um, and it allowed enthusiasts to create repositories of their software for sharing with the wider world and essentially sidestep the complex policy of adding your software into the Debian and Ubuntu archives. So PPAs g g got used in, in a way that was far beyond their original intended purpose. And we also had private PPAs, uh, and this is, was a paid service where um, independent software vendors could publish their software and host DEBs for Ubuntu users. This is the first iteration of um, the documentation for using PPAs. That's the entire page. Um, but that only tells you as a developer how to use a PPA. It doesn't even touch how to create a Debian package. For that, you need the packaging guide. That's a fraction of it. I'm not expecting you to read that, obviously. It's just illustrative. And this also skews heavily towards involving people in the Ubuntu project, not actually talking about how to package your software as devs. So the ARB will save us. So we created the Application Review Board um, to help with the difficulty of creating devs. This was a crack team of Debian packaging experts, and they were assembled to provide help and assistance to um, developers who wanted to publish their software for Ubuntu. They would manually review the devs to make sure that they weren't um, coming from um, a malicious actor. So the limitation of PPAs is this. They are entirely unreviewed. Debian packages have the capability to run as root, well they do run as root, on your system at install and upgrade time. So I could publish in a PPA and I could put maintainer scripts in my Debian package and I can do whatever I want with your system. So the ARB was established to, to try and give some trust to users installing um, these um, published DEBs in that they'd been vetted and approved by uh, a trusted source. And once you'd got your application packaged, you could publish it in the Ubuntu Software Center. Um, this was the graphical storefront that we developed at the time, um, and it made it easier for users to discover software. Um, and they, it, this also had the ability to access these additional repositories, those private PPAs that have gone through application review board assessment, and you could potentially have paid apps in the store. However, the ARB initiative failed um, for a number of reasons. The workload was huge. Uh, the queue of developers waiting to get there for the, for, for the queue of developers waiting to get their stuff reviewed, um, and it was still Debian packaging, so it was still hard, even with some one-to-one -one assistance. The applications needed to be updated for every release of Ubuntu, so you can't just create your application once and publish it in the store. Each interim release, each LTS release, every application that's been published has to be updated accordingly. Developers got frustrated with this and stopped submitting updates, and the ARB got frustrated and stopped reviewing them. We learned a few powerful lessons in this time. So, in 2011, Canonical showed an interest in developing a mobile operating system. Many of you here are well familiar with that, and thankfully it continues today, Ubuntu Touch. 
These devices were built from dev packages, but system updates were delivered as images. A bit, the way, a bit like the way Android works. An entire image could replace the existing image via an over-the-air update. Debian packages don't suit mobile devices for several reasons. Phones are low-powered, resource-constrained devices with unpredictable network connectivity. That unreliability makes it very difficult to guarantee the success of installation and updates of DEB packages. This is a lesson that some mobile developers these days are falling into making this mistake, even though we've demonstrated it didn't work. So a new packaging system was developed. It was called Clix. And for, for those of you that were in uh, Jan's uh, Spritz talk this morning, he talked about you know Click packages and the continuation of using that for the phone today. Clix, self-contained packages designed to run on Ubuntu mobile devices. We uh, created a store again. Um, a self-service system where developers could publish directly. Um, clicks were easier to make than DEBs and had automated review tools, solving that mistake that we had with the ARB, uh, a largely manual process. We never got round to making a web front end for uh, the Click store, but the community did. Uh, it was called UAP Explorer. And that continues today. UAP Explorer is still available and has also been spun off as the open store, which is now the, the app store that uh, Ubuntu Touch devices use. So, what did we learn? As you can see, we had a lot of dis uh, experience distributing software from maintaining curated software archives to satisfying independent software developers and even shipping physical media around the world. And what we learned is this. Debs are hard, the process is complex, humans are slow, discovery is essential, users want new software, and software moves fast. So, let's come back to the original question. Why snaps? So, here's a few reasons in no particular order why we created snaps. Discovery. This is the single most powerful feature of um, Snaps. Discovering new software on Linux is still quite hard. Not quite as hard as rummaging through software catalogs on a BBS, but not far off. Unless you keep your finger on the pulse of listening to podcasts, following YouTube channels, reading uh, the Linux press, you, you can't stay informed of all, all the new software developments and new releases that are happening. And there's also still random PPAs hosting software. I tell you what, does anyone here want to have a guess how many PPAs there are? Don't be shy, we're all friends. Shout out a number, anyone. That, someone said that, a thousand? Thousands, go on. 20,000? 30,000? Any more or less? That's silly, a million, go to bed. <laughs> There's 170,000 PPAs. Good luck finding your software amongst 170,000 PPAs. We know this because we recently reviewed them all. Shall I tell you another interesting fact? The PPA that generates the most traffic that most people are hitting every day looking for an update or an installation doesn't even exist anymore. It got deleted a couple of years ago. It's the mo most popular PPA. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that, because <laughs> it's also embedded in Chef, Ansible, and Puppet recipes that are used at a massive scale, which is why it's the most popular PPA. So this thing is embedded in there. People are inst installing this application, thinking they're getting the new version, and they're not. They're getting the version from the archive. There are also GitHub repositories with daily builds and releases. But you'll never know any of that software exists because you, you don't sit up late into the evening digging through the GitHub new, new releases page. 
but we do. So my team at Canonical spend a significant amounts of our time searching out developers and contacting them uh, and helping them bring their software to the Snap Store. If you publish your software in the Snap Store, you will reach more users than any other software distrib distribution platform available for Linux. So we frequently rotate the featured applications and the editor's picks in the store. That's um, GNOME software. Uh, that's the web UI to the, um, to the software center. Um, we see a significant jump in installation of software that we feature in the editor's picks. So we know that that works. We also promote new software or celebrate new editions of software on our social media channels as well. And we're able to track the effectiveness of that, and I'll show you how later. So for years we've been doing this. Developers get a spotlight, end users get new software. This is an example of an application that came into the Snap Store. So down here, it got published, literally, literally crickets. This, by the way, isn't uh, an unknown bit of software. I can guarantee all of you, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but all of you know would know this application if you, I gave you the name. So then we did a social media campaign, and that was the uptick in adoption. And then we featured it in the store, uh, and that was the uptick in adoption. So we know that this App Store concept works. We then started to reach the next set of developers, people who would never have targeted Linux before. Uh, this is a company called Hiri. Um, they were previously held back by the inability to uh, market themselves to millions of Linux users. Um, so these startups started creating snaps. Now Hiri, uh, they actually make a mail client that, that hooks into Exchange and Office 365 and Outlook and all of that sort of stuff. And it's cross-platform. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And they chose to uh, exclusively target Linux users through the Snap Store. Hiri now make 25% of their revenue from the Snap alone. Well, thank you very much. I'll pass on your applause to, uh, to David at Hiri. Um, also, a popular browser vendor publishes a snap in the store, and they've grown their Linux audience by 100% uh, by doing so. So, how does all this work? Um, snaps use standard Linux uh, security primitives like AppArmor, Cgroups, and SecComp to define the applications. Um, this gives us a fake view of, or gives each snap a fake view of the world in a container-like environment. So, uh, you know, I, I imagine a number of you have uh, attended the talks this week about LexD and Docker and various other container technologies. Not dissimilar. Users typically do not want their address book app to be able to open their camera without their permission. Web browsers shouldn't be able to rummage through your SSH and GPG keys. A video player shouldn't be able to reach into your crypto wallet and steal your coins. Snaps give users that kind of control. Confinement is hard, however, um, because the vast majority of applications written for Linux have not been written with confinement in mind. So we work with developers to help them uh, modify their applications when necessary to work better in a confined environment. And so what we're looking at here, I don't know if you've seen this kind of makeup before, but we have snaps use a core snap. <coughs> That's like a thin, very thin Ubuntu runtime. The first time you install a snap, the core snap gets installed first. And this is what actually makes it possible to install snaps on multiple Linux distributions because you're not relying on the runtime of CentOS, Fedora, Arch Linux, Manjaro, and Debian, and what have you. The snaps then sit on top of that core snap where there's a common ABI. So then each snap uh, sits in its own sandbox. 
Uh, they're read-only. They can't be tampered with by the host operating system. Snaps can't tamper with each other. And each snap has its own partitioned writable area for data should it require it. In the past, if you wanted new software on your existing install, you could upgrade to another distribution. Uh, you could hunt down software in PPAs or build it from source. Or you could in, in, you know, install a completely different distribution that moves faster and breaks more often. Hello, Arch users. <laughs> With applications as snaps, you can stay on 1804 and 1604 for longer and still get new software. You get the benefit of a stable, reliable, security-maintained base operating system with your confined applications on top. You can even go as far back as Ubuntu 14.04, which is now five years old, has just exited standard security maintenance and entered in extended security maintenance. So snaps, that you could publish a snap today, it will work all the way back to 14.04, and guaranteed to work on 1804, 1910 that comes out next week, and 2004 that comes out in April next year, and 2204 that comes out two, two years later. So having one package which can be installed on 50 different distributions is compelling for developers. And when I talk about 50 distributions here, I'm not counting Debian 9 and Debian 10 as two, we just count Debian. Okay, so the multiple releases of Fedora is Fedora, not six versions of Fedora or whatever it might be. So this saves a tremendous amount of time. The developers don't have to rebuild and repackage their software for every Ubuntu release. They also don't need to, uh, sorry, and it also means that users can hop onto different Linux distributions like Linux Mint or Debian or Fedora or Zorin or KDE Neon, Elementary, Manjaro, Arch, CentOS, Gallium OS, sent, you know, there's plenty to choose from. You can do that and you can take those snaps with you. And if the snaps don't work on those other operating systems, that's a bug on us to fix. So the Snap Store has some additional um, developer features over and above just being a repository of snaps. Developers can push their apps to the store at their own cadence and not have to wait for distribution maintainers to catch up. The store can ho host multiple versions in different channels. These are risk-based channels. So let's just explain that. This is an example of VLC. Um, you can see here, latest stable version 306. This slide is old, by the way. <laughs> um, but then you can see they've got a beta release here, which is newer. And then they also have uh, the current version of uh, 4 from Gitmaster in their Edge channel. So by default, when you install a snap, it comes from the stable channel, as you would expect, the current stable release. But users can choose to switch between channels at will. Developers can even request that intrepid users help them with beta testing. With a single command at the command line or a single click in GNOME software, you can hop from the stable channel to the beta channel. If the developer puts out a call for action to say, hey, come and test our new version, you can hop onto the beta channel run through the tests, send your feedback, and then hop straight back onto the stable channel. Or you can have multiple snaps from the same application installed side by side. So let's look at an example of that. Just bear with me. Right. So we can do that with tracks. Well, tracks and channels as it happens. But this is an example of how Mozilla published Firefox in the Snap Store. What you'll see here is we've got the stable channel, we've got candidate, and you can see a uh, newer version in beta and actually have old versions in Edge. I think, I think they've actually stopped using Edge now. They published directly to beta. But then down here, you see ESR stable. 
So what Firefox is doing is continually pushing the newest versions into the stable channels and the beta channels, but then they, they use the ESR for their extended, um, what do they call it? Extended secure, whatever ESR means, I forget. S extended support release, did somebody say? Thank you at the back, thank you. Spared my blushes. Um, and that version is used by academic institutions and government organizations and schools and what have you who want to uh, deploy uh, a supported version for the long term because they, they may have you know orchestration around uh, managing and configuring shit and that. But you can install the ESR release and the stable release side by side. So on your machine, you could have the current stable version and the ESR version uh, installed in parallel. So sometimes things break. So if an update uh, goes bad, we have health checks, which can automatically roll back a failed update. Uh, users can also choose to roll back. You know, if an update gets pushed out automatically and it changes something or breaks in some way on your machine, you can choose as the user to roll it back. Developers can also roll back manually too. We'll come back to that in a moment. And developers also get metrics showing weekly active devices. This is something that they wouldn't get from any other um, you know, Linux distribution mechanism. I'll explain why that's useful in just a moment. So oh, here's an example, um, which is not from VLC, um, where a buggy version of an application was rolled out. Um, and we can see that here, this lilac bit here, okay? So, it didn't fail its automatic update checks because those were all fine, but the software had a bug in it. So, you can see here, this orange represents the previous version. They were rolling out the new version, found the bug, rolled back to the previous version, and you can see just about everyone rolled back to the previous version and then this bit here is where they release a new new version again, which has the fix, and then this is how quickly everyone ramps up and gets to that. But what you can see from this as well, there is no long tail of old versions out there in the wild. And this is also really attractive to um, software publishers, because now they don't have to have that conversation about what version are you running. They know you're on the latest version. Now, this is also useful, these kind of metrics. Philip Ballou gave a presentation earlier in the week about helping coders, hello, helping coders to market their software. So you can use these metrics, which are all de-identified. You can't tell who the individual users are. It's all aggregate data, and we worked quite hard to ensure that all of this was GDPR compliant, which it is. <coughs> But as you saw in my earlier slide, if you have a you can put a marker in your metrics to say, today is the day we did our social campaign announcing our new version of our software. You can then look at the uptick and growth in installations from that marker that you put in your metrics to see how effective that campaign was. Or if you come to us and you say, hey, we haven't been featured in the store recently. We've got a new release. We'd really like to be in the, the next round of editor's picks, and we do that, you can also measure what the uptick in adoption was like as a result of that. So, Philip is right. If you're working on open source or free software and you want people to use it, you have to tell people. This is a separate, <laughs> separate from this talk, but we are, as a community, we're terrible at that. So, how does it all work? Let's have a quick look. So, uh, we have Snap. So snapd is a daemon that runs, and it facilitates the install, update, and removal of snaps. It's also the thing that mediates the confinement that I talked about earlier. Snap is a command line utility that talks to snapd via its API so that you can snap install Firefox. And snapcraft is a easy to use but powerful meta build system that enables you to create snaps. Uh, and publish them in the store. 
It's also a mechanism by which you can debug snaps as you're iterating on them locally. And it's also a way by which you can create snaps locally and install them locally. So you don't have to publish them in the store whilst you're developing them. You can just build, work on them iterative locally, install them locally, and then publish them when you're ready. Snapcraft.yaml is a simple declarative file. This is how you uh, instruct Snapcraft to compose a snap. It's one YAML. They're typically 30 lines long. Most of that is metadata, versions, descriptions, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you've packaged RPMs and used spec files or Debian control or Arch Linux PKG builds, it's, it's that but much simpler. So Snapcraft support uh, Snapcraft is uh, supported as a first-class citizen in um, Travis CI and Circle CI. So if you're using Travis or Circle, there are now Snapcraft stanzas in their configuration that enable you to compose snaps directly in their CI systems. Moreover, if you have uh, build time requirements in those environments, you can uh, instruct Travis and Circle to install those snaps to satisfy your build requirements. Um, and we've also developed a GitHub integrated build service. And it connects GitHub projects directly to uh, the build service at Canonical so that any open source project that's on GitHub can just say, I want to make this a snap. It bounces you through authentication, hooks up GitHub to effectively Launchpad, and every time you commit, it will automatically build your software and publish it in the Edge channel um, of the store. Now, that also works for the six supported architectures. So now you can build your application for 32 and 64-bit Intel, 32 and 64-bit ARM, and power, and if you've got a mainframe, S390. And perhaps you prefer Docker or GitLab or Jenkins for your CI CD. Uh, and integrating Snapcraft in um, Jenkins and, what did I say? Uh, GitLab is very easy. In fact, the GNOME projects that are all hosted on GitLab that publish snaps, all of that CI CD happens in GitLab. Uh, and we publish um, Docker images of Snapcraft. So if you have um, you know, Docker in your CI CD pipeline, you can access a Docker image of Snapcraft, which has got everything in it. In term you need to build your projects. And naturally, snaps uh, can be built directly inside of Launchpad as well. And the Launchpad thing can also automatically publish them for you as well. Now, I was shocked to learn that not all developers are using the Ubuntu desktop. So, Snapcraft development can also be uh, done on macOS and Windows. Uh, developers using Windows and macOS can create a Linux package directly on Windows and macOS using Snapcraft, and also publish it to the store. This is particularly powerful for uh, Electron developers, uh, who typically are targeting multi-platform and more often than not are using a Mac to do that because that's the only way you can target Electron on all three platforms. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the Snapcraft development workflow is identical on all three platforms. So, I've been told I've got five minutes. I think I'm nearly there. <coughs> Snap publishers. We've created a software pipeline that directly connects developers to users. Developers are put in full control of the publishing life cycle, and rather than waiting for distribution uh, maintainers uh, and packages to deliver their software update, they can um, control that for themselves. So who is publishing in the store? Well, th these were among the first. Snaps are incredibly popular to giant software publishers who are just as time poor as the rest of us. I was astonished to learn this. We had one software vendor explain to us, Linux is 1.97% of our user base. 
you have precisely 1.97% of my attention. We have lowered the barrier for ISVs who want to target Linux by providing a single platform. ISVs are already accustomed to be, being authoritative publishers of their applications in an app store. The Snap Store offers a familiar paradigm to those developers and users now. And it's not just desktop software either. Snaps may contain command line utilities, compilers, complex servers, cloud orchestration tools, the, the, the whole gamut. The leading public cloud providers are all publishing snaps of their management agents and their clients. And the smaller cloud providers have followed suit. Some of those management agents, snaps, are embedded in their cloud images. They are being used at a massive scale to orchestrate the fabric of their platforms. Snapcraft has been a success. There are tens of millions of applications in use right now as snaps. Publishers published in the store by the likes of Microsoft, and Google, and Amazon, and JetBrains, and Mozilla, and thousands of other independent software vendors, organizations, and individual developers. We are seeing steady growth in new applications coming into the Snap Store every single day. There is not a day that goes by when there is not new software, and I'm not talking about updates, a new software title. Developers and ISVs have chosen Snapcraft because they love the amazing publisher experience. And today, Snapcraft truly is the Linux app store. So if you want to know more, snapcraft.io is where to go. Uh, you'll find documentation and guides there. We have a blog. We publish articles about how to do stuff how to make IoT devices with Ubuntu Core and Snaps. We publish developer interviews with people that have created Snaps. We have a forum. The entire Snapcraft and SnapD team and security team are there. If you want to talk about Snaps, you ask there. You will get an authoritative answer from one of the developers. And we also run video workshops on YouTube from time to time. And follow us on Twitter and Mastodon and Facebook and what have you. You'll get daily updates, new software that you may be interested in, tips and tricks for developers. Later this afternoon in S1 Disco Room, which I think is over there, I'm going to be doing a Snapcraft AMA. Upstairs, upstairs. Uh, that's at 4.30 today with me. So if you've got questions, we're not going to have time now, sadly. But we have a whole other session where you can come and Ask me all the difficult questions you're thinking of right now. Uh, and I'd also like to highlight that my colleague uh, Marco Trevason is presenting tomorrow in this room at 11 o'clock, and he's going to be telling you about the making of Ubuntu Desktop 2004. I highly recommend you go to that one. So I would say right now, questions. Think of your questions. Oh, well, have we got time? Have we got time for some questions? We have time for a few questions. Okay. <laughs> so when will we be able to build private snaps in Snapcraft store, like on the build service? Because uh, we actually need to build a private software right. uh, in our company, and uh, we are kind of stuck right now. Uh, it's coming quite soon. So there's a couple of... We've got a feature now, remote build, where you can actually, from your workstation, say, I want to build this snap, but not on my computer build it directly in Launchpad for me, maybe for just this weird architecture. Maybe you're an IoT developer and you want an ARM HF build, but you, you've got an Intel workstation. That remote build capability will soon grow the ability to say, and do this privately, but building private snaps will be a paid service. Sure. Okay, but that is coming. Thank you. Uh, I about the developers uh, verification on yeah. the snap store yeah I have a question that why aren't the snap crafters verified yet they will never be verified so the only org the only people that we organize uh, uh, let's start that sentence again use the right words in the right order the only um, snaps publishers that get verified are organizations 
who have registered an organizational account that is tied to an email address at the domain that that project is hosted in. So Mozilla, Skype, um, the Tor project, you know, that we verify them. I don't, as an individual, I don't get to be verified. Snapcrafters is a community effort composed of dozens of community contributors. It's not authoritative. It's, it, we, we're never going to you know, verify that. Can we trust them? Sorry? Can we trust them? I, I can't hear you, sorry. Can we trust the Snapcrafters? I hope so, yes. <laughs> so uh, Je Je there is some policy there. Al uh, Popey and I are gatekeepers on the Snapcrafters snaps. So you can't publish an update in the store as a Snapcrafter unless Alan and I have eyeballed the code. So we are providing some gatekeeping there. I hope so. I mean, I work for Canonical. I mean, I've got a vested interest in make, making a trusted platform. Hi, just a question about the, the graph that you showed about the weekly uh, active devices. Right. Uh, so just to be clear, so that's not installations that are actually executions. So when I run a snap, Snap, they will call home to tell Canonical that I'm running that software. Um, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, SnapD will say, here is a device that is on that has SnapD installed and these snaps, right? Therefore, I'm an active device. What it doesn't do is you start app foo. And it says, aha, this device has just executed app foo. We don't do that. No. Okay, I think this is it. Right. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.